Welcome to day three of problem solving with Smithsonian experts. We are so glad you're with us today for unlocking the mysteries of the universe. This is one key theme of four that helped define our conference together. And we welcome everyone back who was here with us for parts one and two. If you missed those parts, we have six wonderful sessions recorded for you. You can find those on the program page. But today we begin six more live sessions. Our first session is asking the question, are there other worlds out there? And Lisa Kaltenegger will be our guest. On the top left corner of the screen, you can see a question that she posed to all of us to get us thinking about this topic. And that is, what interests you about this search for other worlds or other Earths, other environments, planets like ours? And you can see a number of your colleagues who are with us have begun to pose their own questions and thoughts on this topic. We encourage you to continue to do that throughout. We have a lot of questions and a lot of sharing to do with all of you, and we hope you'll share with us. Here are three ways to do that. I'm bringing it up on your screen right now. Three ways that you can communicate. One is using the chat box on the left side of the screen, as many of you are doing right now. Uh, the other way to communicate with us is to chat. The, excuse me, text the word chat and your message to 22333. Uh, that works, I believe, in the US only. But if you would like to use Twitter, you can send the word chat to at poll, at poll chat and your message to Twitter. So three ways to send your messages in to us. Thank you to our friend in Jakarta who sends her greetings to Lisa, among many others who are sharing their hellos with us today. So we encourage you to share as we go along. A couple of other quick things. We are closed captioning today's event, so you will see in real time the words that we are speaking appearing on your screen. Uh, you're welcome to keep those up, and we encourage you to do so. But if at any point you need to turn those off as participants, you can do so by clicking on the little CC icon on the right side of your screen. And from the display menu, you can choose none to turn that off if you need to. All right, we've got some great questions coming in, Lisa. I'm going to turn to her in a moment so she can begin to ask a few questions of us and explain her great work. One last thing I wanted to mention is we also have on with us Dan Porter, my colleague joining us from the United Kingdom. He is just outside London, if I'm not mistaken, and he is our illustrator here today trying to capture the imagination of all of us and of Lisa's talk in the form of an illustration. For those of you who were with us a week and a half ago during our session on Who Owns Music, here is Dan Porter's wonderful illustration from that session. So stay tuned at the end. We'll check in with Dan and see how he has captured our interaction in the form of a real-time illustration. So thank you, Dan Porter. Glad to have you with us. I'm going to go ahead now and thank one last group of people before we get started. Um, first of all, I want to thank our conveners, our organizers here at the Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies. Their website, of course, is Smithsonian Education, and you can find them in our virtual exhibit hall and learn all about the great learning content that they have brought together and helped create from across the Smithsonian. And that's what this live event is all about, bringing together people from across the Smithsonian. And it's, variety, it's a variety of units and museums. You'll see a great selection in our exhibit hall for all of the content that's been shared on this topic of problem solving. Finally, I'm going to thank our sponsor, Microsoft Partners in Learning. We appreciate their support to help us bring this event to you. With that, it gives me great pleasure to turn the floor over now to Lisa Kaltenegger, who is going to help us in our search for other worlds and tell us where she is at in answering this question and help us explore it with her. I'll be on hand with Lisa to help field your questions, but now we'll turn the floor over to her. Lisa. Hi. So hi, everybody. Uh, and very welcome to this uh, online chat that allows me actually to also get some of your questions that i will be more than happy to answer. So I had a look at some of them you posted. I'm happy to say we're going to go through it today, and I hope you'll enjoy what you see. But before, in case you actually hear a little of a delay when I talk, uh, this is actually because I am not in the United States, unless Jonathan and uh, unlike Jonathan and Adam, I'm actually in Austria because we are in a very big meeting that addresses exactly that. How can we find other worlds? How can you build them? What do you look for? And so I'm giving a talk here tomorrow and uh, after about 24 hours of flying, I got here today and I wanted to share with you how it looks like here. So you have a, a vision of this place. I don't know how good that's going to work because I'm not going to see that much, but 
as a start. This is where I am right now. So this is the part in Austria where I am right now. And as you see, we're starting to uh, get really uh, evening light here. And it's about 5 o'clock. And I'll just put the computer on the power source, and I'll be with you. So uh, what I wanted to address today, and I looked through with some of the questions you guys already posted, is if there are other planets, other worlds out there, and how we actually go about finding this pale blue dot. Because it's a fascinating time. The really, really great thing about our time right now is that we're very, very, very close to finding planets that could be like ours. And that's the new exciting fact. So I brought this question up, so Jonathan brought this question up about, do you think there are planets like ours out there? And I'll give you a minute because I'm actually curious how many of you think there are and how many of you think there aren't. And uh, after we go through the talk, I can't answer it yet because we haven't found any Earth analog uh, planet yet, but after the talk, I'll show you how close we actually are to answering that question. So, so far, about 80% of people think that there are other planets like ours out there, so small and rocky, and roughly like the picture you see there. So, let me just start and show you some of the really exciting stuff that we have been doing. So, uh, are there other worlds out there like our own? Well, there are actually worlds out there. I showed you this very, very pretty picture here, right? So this is the Earth, and let me just get the pointer up here. So this is the Earth, and what do you have here? It's actually the atmosphere of the Earth, see? So this part is the rocky part, and this is the rim, so the atmosphere, everything that you and me actually breathe. So this is what we're breathing here. And I'll just turn off the video for now, so actually the people who don't have great bandwidth can conserve it and just concentrate on the talk. And after that, I'll bring it back up and uh, we can talk face to face. So are there other worlds like ours? This is what we're looking for, this small, tiny, pale blue dots. So what have we found? That's actually what we already found. And this is, of course, an artist's impression because we do not have any images of these planets yet. But you do see that we have something that is rocky that's very, very, very close to orbiting its star. So think about it. If you're really close to your star, that means it's incredibly hot. It's basically like a bonfire. So you're very close to it. It's incredibly hot. You're too far away of it, from it. It's really, really cold. So you want to be at this perfect distance, uh, just where it's not too hot and not too cold. And this is where we look for these planets. This is what we call the habitable zone, where there could be liquid water on the surface of this planet. And I put in a quote here that I really like. One So there's a question already in there. It's like, why would you assume blue? Well, the water that we're looking for uh, is basically one of the things that we're looking for uh, if we look for life. We do not know any other way to generate life here on Earth, and biologists do not think there's another way than uh, to have water. So what you want to do is go and look for water in the first place. So finding these Pale blue dots, that's the name that Sagan gave it. <clears throat> Sorry. That's the name that Sagan gave our, Sagan gave our own planet.
planet because when you look at the earth it looks nice and blue and you know that 70 percent of the earth's surface is actually made out of water not made out of continents so this is why we very much appear blue so let's have a look this is all the planets we have right now in our universe so we have eight in the universe sorry in our solar system so we have eight and you see that this is our sun and this is not the scale and then we have the rocky planets <clears throat> we have the rocky planets inside so you see mercury venus that's us earth oh sorry i should bring the pointer up so you can see the inner mouth being mercury then you have venus then it's the earth and here you have mars so these are the four rocky planets in our system and then you have the giant systems the giant planets out there so you have jupiter you have saturn uranus and neptune so we are the third rock from the sun this is us so like for the bonfire we are just at the right distance from the star where it's not too hot where it's not too cold where we could have liquid water on the surface of such a planet and it did develop life so there is so many stars out there this is one of the things that i want you to think about if you actually on the earth put all the grains of sand all the pebbles all the rocks everything you find lying around together this is not yet the number of stars that are out there but we haven't found many planets yet many insofar because they are very difficult to find they're very small and they're next to a very bright star so if you think about it in terms of size it's basically like the sun is the size of a grapefruit that's the sun and then the earth we are here is roughly the size of a mustard seed so just think about it all these points of light that you see in the sky at night they're stars some of them are more than one star but they're roughly stars so you see the big bright grapefruits and now we're going out to find something that's much much smaller and so i'll show you what we have done so far and what we're looking for but before i do that i actually just want to get a feeling how many extrasolar planets do you guys think have been found so far? And yeah, Lisa, we brought that question, question up, and you can go ahead and so, look through the list of choices, everyone, and choose the one you think is the right answer. Let, let's find out. And by the way, we and we have a lot let's of good questions coming in, by think? the way. We're going to do our best to get to as many of those as we can as we go along as well, too. So, Lisa, we're seeing 500 takes the lead here. Wow, that's actually very impressive. So yeah, it's actually roughly around, we have like 400 plus of planets that we already found. And I'll show you how we did that. And I'll show you why it's becoming so exciting right now. So just in another context, because we're talking about the search for life, this is our Milky Way, so our galaxy. You see the center with lots of stars in the middle, and then, so the center is here, and then you see us. We are roughly here, so you're here. And then when people talk about aliens and when they worry about aliens, then the funny part about it is actually that they usually worry about this, right? So they worry about aliens, maybe they're coming to Earth, hopefully they have peaceful intentions, but they're basically always envisioning a saucer, a UFO, an unidentified flight object, that actually comes to us to say hi. And then if you go further than that, you then have uh, an ET, an extraterrestrial intelligence. And this is from a very old movie that I don't know if you guys all saw, but it's very cute. It's a movie about ET who's trying to get back home because he crash landed on our planet. And I got myself into trouble at one point because I said that all science fiction uh, or most of the science fiction talk about beings that have two eyes, that have two arms, that have two legs. And I thought that was actually pretty limited because why do you think it's going to be exactly the same like us? So then a friend of mine sent me this. 
So apparently our view of alien beings is wide open, so we can even imagine them having three eyes instead of two. Why I wanted to bring this up is just, I have seen a couple of the questions out there, they were excellent. They were asking whether or not there's gonna be humans, you and me on this planet. And that's a question that's gonna take a little while longer to answer because there could be other animals, there could be other life forms, there could be humanoid things that are completely different. And so far, we really have not a good idea what biology can produce, but it's gonna be very exciting once we get there. What I wanted to show you guys is also a picture, a picture of our own pale blue dot, so a picture of our own Earth. And can you spot the picture, the Earth? It's actually really, really hard to do, so I'll spot it for you. So this is the furthest away picture that has ever been taken of our own planet. This is the Earth, you, me, everybody else this tiny dot, and because it's still in our solar system, because a mission that's called Voyager took that image, so it hasn't left our solar system yet, we can zoom in. So instead of seeing this nice blue dot with continents and water, you see a speckle of light. You basically see a tiny point of light, and that tiny point of light is what you see. And it's incredible how much information you can get out of such a tiny point of light. So the big problem that you actually have is that the planet that's very small and not very bright because it generally reflects light or emits it because it's hot, is very, very close to the star. So the star is incredibly bright. And so you're trying to find something that's incredibly close to it, but not as bright. So the way you actually have to do it is you have to block out the light of the star. And you can either do that by building a mask. <laughs> it's basically like if you're trying to look for something that's really bright and you're shielding your eyes with your hand, that's what we're doing. So we're building a mask that suppresses the light of the star. Or you can actually just use light, a combination of lights, if you have, one, if you have more than one telescope, to do that, to do the exact same thing. So there are a couple of ways, and in the laboratories, we've actually shown that we can do that. So it's pretty exciting. But once you have this tiny point of light, and here I show you another image from our own Earth, because this is what our own Earth looks like if you look at it from Mars. So again, not very far away, our closest planet over. So this is our Earth, and this is our Moon. But so if you have this light or if you have this point of light, how can you say what's going on in such a planet? And there's a trick. And the trick is actually that you can make a fingerprint. Remember that when you go on a crime scene, CSI or whatever show you watch, that's how they're basically figuring out who the culprit is. So what you do is you split up the light. And I don't know if you've done this in the physics experiments. Usually we're doing the physics experiments in school where you have white light, then you have like a triangle, and it splits up the light from red to blue. It's basically a similar thing that we do. And if you split it up and then just record how intense or how much light you get at this wavelength, so you have a look how much light you get in the blue, where it's blue, that'd be here. Whoops, the pointer doesn't like me. So here. And then you just record how bright it is in the red, so you record here. And from that, you can actually say what is in the atmosphere. Because if there's no atmosphere, what you would see is actually very nice, smooth curve here. So this smooth curve is what you would see from a planet if there were no atmosphere at all. At all. But as you see in this graph, there's something missing. There's something missing here. That indicates that there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's something missing here that indicates that there's ozone in the atmosphere, so oxygen. And there's something missing here and here. And that indicates that there's water. So by splitting up the light, and here it just, uh, it's the same if you do it from 
the blue to the red, or if you do it in the thermal infrared with, where you actually record the heat, then if there's something missing, if there's energy that's absorbed, that's taken out, then you know that there is chemicals in the atmosphere of that planet. And the exciting thing is that exactly where this feature is, exact, for example here, this is uh, the infrared 15 microns for carbon dioxide, but exactly where it is tells you what chemical it is. So if there's an absorption here, if there's some energy missing here, you can say that that's carbon dioxide. If it's here, you can say that that's ozone. So it's a very telltale fingerprint that tells you what a planet light years away, really, really, really far away, is made out of, the atmosphere of it. And I think that's pretty amazing. So it is a kind of spectral fingerprint. And we record this light. Remember this tiny, speckle of light, the spot of light, this white thing, and we split up the light. And then we have a look what the atmosphere is made out of on such an alien planet. So let me just go back a little, because I said that it's like splitting up the light that we see from the red to the blue. And I assume many of you have done that in the class. But we're actually also using something that we call the infrared light. And the infrared light is where you actually see heat. So I don't know if you've ever had these infrared goggles where you can actually see people at night because they're hotter than their surrounding area. So there's these red things that walk around. It's basically the same idea. Our soldiers use it a lot. But so what you see here, for example, is a coffee cup, right? And the coffee cup here, well, it uh, is sitting there or it's tea, whatever you like, or hot chocolate. But say it would be really useful to know whether or not you have to put it in the microwave or not, right? But we see in the visible because the sun gives most of its energy in the visible. So our eyes have adopted through evolution. So we see in the visible. But if we could see the infrared, we could see things that are hot. And you'd immediately know if the coffee needs to go in the microwave or not. So if you have that, there's a couple of useful things. For example, if you have your shoe and you really want to consider whether or not you should take some time before you put it back on. In this case, you should because it's really hot inside still. So you might want to air it out. But just to give you an idea what we'll be doing. So if we look in the visible where you and I see, we can see certain things. And then if we look in the infrared, we can see heat. We know if this thing is hot or if this thing is cold. And we can again, in both wavelengths range, actually do see whether or not there are chemicals in the atmosphere, telltale signs of life, as I will show you in a little. So you have this dot of light and you split out the light. And this is the visible wavelength range on the left. And then you have the infrared wavelength range on the right. So this is the visible where you and I see, and this is the infrared. And this curve here, how much energy you actually get in the infrared, tells you roughly how hot the planet is. So voila, you already know roughly how hot it is there. And again, everything that's taken out here, you see the things missing, there's something missing here, there's something missing here. Exactly where it's missing tells you what atmosphere is on that planet. And in our case, with small telescopes, the next generation of things we're building, about three meter in space, uh, three times three meter or about a six meter telescope that is actually one single dish, you can see that there's carbon dioxide, ozone, water, and methane. So it's pretty exciting because you have the most important gas is already right there. So how do we actually find planets? Well, right now we haven't really found so many in terms of uh, actually looking at them. And actually, uh, Jonathan is going to bring the other in, uh, animation back in, because the other animation is what I'm going to show you first, the one on the left corner. So if a planet actually goes around a star, what it does, it actually pulls and tugs at that star. And by tugging at that star, the star moves. And this is what we can actually observe. So we see the star wobble back and forth. And then if by chance, if you have a look at this animation again, if by chance 
the star actually, the planet actually goes by chance between you and me. So you see here, you don't see any blockage of light of the star. But if by chance the planet goes within our line of sight, so it comes between us and the star, we see for a certain amount of time the star being a little dimmer. And this is what you can see here on the right. So the planet goes in front of the star, and you see that the light from the star, because we can't see the planet really yet, gets dimmer periodically whenever the planet goes in front of it. So during that time, the planet, the star is just a little bit dimmer. And this is what we can do. So we either have a look if something tucks at the star, so we get how massive the planet is that goes around it, or we have a look if a star periodically dims, and that tells you how big the planet is, because the bigger the planet, the more the star is going to dim, right? So if you think about that, this is what we use to find more than 400 other planets out there. So we know about more than 400 other worlds already out there. Most of them are huge, because just think about it. It's so much easier to find the big thing. Whether it is because the star wobbles, something bigger is just going to tug it so much more, so it's going to be so much easier to find, or because it actually blocks out stellar light. So if the planet is bigger, it blocks out more stellar light, and thus it's going to be easier to find. But so if there are the same amount of big planets and the same amount of small planets in the, uh, out there around other stars, that would tell you that we should have found a lot, a lot, a lot of the big planets. And the really curious thing is, we're finding more and more of the small ones. So if you have a look at the graph that I just brought in on the left, what you see here is the mass of the planet. This is this axis. So big mass of the planet is here on the right. Small mass of the planet is here on the left. And then this is the number of planets. And this graph is a tad outdated, but roughly it's the same thing. What you do see, what's incredibly curious, is actually that we find many more small planets than big planets. And so from what I told you, is we can find the big ones so much easier. So we don't. We don't find more big ones. That actually means that there must be much more small ones out there. So it's incredibly interesting that there should be a lot of small planets out there. And we are just getting to the point where we're going to be able to find them. So there are new worlds in our sky. More than 400, actually. Already, some of them are incredibly hot. Some of them are incredibly cold. And the first couple of them, actually now start to be smaller and potentially rocky. This graph that I brought in is what we can do right now. And I'll walk you from there to what we're going to be able to do in the future. What you see on the uppermost uh, left is actually an image, one of the first images of a planet that isn't in our own solar system. And this is this tiny thing here. It's actually in here in the disk, so we blocked out the star. This is an image that has been taken with Hubble, a telescope that is up in space. And if you've ever seen these amazing images from space, they're all from Hubble. But so they block out the star, because if not, you can't find the planet, because it's so dim in comparison. This is why you see a black hole or a black area. It's not a black hole, a black area in the middle. It just means that there's a mass that blocks out the starlight here. And here, there's a tiny point, and you see 2004 and 2006. So there's a tiny point of light, a planet, that has been detected very, very far away from its star that's orbiting it. So that's going around the star like the Earth is going around the sun. But it's very, very far away from its star. But it's the image of the first big planet that we found. And then the other thing that I'm going to show you in a little is that when the planet actually blocks out light and it goes in front of the star, there's this tiny point, this tiny area here, the atmosphere of the planet, that we saw in the beginning on our own Earth, right? This tiny, tiny area. 
And what you see is that while the planet goes in front of the star, part of the starlight comes or basically passes through the atmosphere of the planet. When the, when the planet is solid here, it's blocked out. But part of the light from the star gets modified because it actually passes through the atmosphere of the star. Uh, through the atmosphere of the planet, sorry. And so this is what we can do right now. And I'll show you in the next few slides how we do this. And this is what we're going to be doing next. So what we want to do is actually find the smaller planet closer to their star so they could be habitable. And we want to get the part of the light that goes through the atmosphere for one of these smaller planets. So, if you have that, well, what do you do? The really, really curious thing is what we're finding right now is things that are somewhere between a gas giant, like Neptune, Jupiter, Saturn, the things that are really fluffy, and if you had a huge, huge basin of water, uh, a bath tube of the universe, and you plug it in, you just throw it in there, Saturn, Saturn would swim. The Earth, because it's rocky, would sink. But we're finding right now things that are in between that we don't know about because we don't have any of them in our own solar system. So some that are about 10 times the Earth's mass, and so we keep calling them super Earth in case they're rocky. And maybe they're mini Neptunes, it's just a smaller version of the giant planets. But in case they're rocky, they could be the first habitable worlds that we actually already find in. And I'll show you a trick how we can figure out if they could be habitable. So if there actually could be things like life on there. So, let's get started. Signs of life on an Earth-like planet. Hmm, and here Noah actually figuring, trying to figure out how I know this. Well, we have a sample of one. That's our own Earth. And that's what we actually try, that's what we're using, that's what we're trying to use to figure out how to look for life out there. So, we think you need water for life. So you can look for water on this planet. Then plants produce oxygen and ozone. Bacteria produces something that's called nitrous oxide. And there's some other things that are confusing because you have carbon dioxide and methane. There could be indications for life, but they don't have to be. And if you have a very big telescope, you can see surface features. And so, there was just a question that came up. I just saw this in the uh, corner of my eyes that was saying about if we found, oh yeah, so basically Trisha was asking if we actually found other planets or just their atmospheres. So actually it's much easier to find the planet because it blocks out the light of the star, right? So it's this huge planet that blocks out the light of the star. But if the atmosphere is very, very, very fluffy, so it's very, very non-dense, then part of the stellar light goes through the atmosphere too. And so we can characterize the atmosphere. It's a much harder thing to do than finding the planet. But we have two cases, maybe three cases, where we've already done that. But they're huge, like Jupiter, bigger than Jupiter, actually. So... Finding their atmosphere was the big step that let us actually characterize it. So there was another question, if a super-Earth can be a mini-Neptune. Well, the mass of the planets is definitely similar. So we just call something that's about 10 Earth masses either a super-Earth or a mini-Neptune because by now we don't really know if it's made out of rocks or if it's just a smaller version of Jupiter. So we actually have to find one and characterize its atmosphere to tell you. But we did find uh, already one that transits, so it goes in front of its stars. Not, we couldn't do anything about the atmosphere in that one because it's too far away. Plus, it tucks on its star, so we know its mass and we know its radius. So if you have the mass and the radius, you can get roughly its density. And for that one, Corot 7b, it's actually denser than Earth. 
So we know that such a planet can be a, a super Earth. And we found another one, GJ1214, that's much, much, much more fluffy than Earth. So we see that the whole range exists already. So right now we can't tell you without knowing radius and mass whether you're looking at a mini Neptune or a super Earth, but we found two candidates and one seemed to be or two planets already in this mass range and one is very rocky, very dense, and one is actually very fluffy. So there are mini Neptunes out there and there are super Earths out there and they have the same mass, they have the same weight, but they're completely different because one is very solid like our own Earth and one is very, very fluffy. So a mini Neptune would be something that's very fluffy and a super Earth is something that's actually very, very dense. So, but if you had a super Earth and if unlike Coro 7b, Coro 7b is so close to its star that it's so incredibly hot there, if it were not that close to its star, if it were just at the right distance, it's not too hot for water to be on the surface, what could you look for? And so you see that the things you can look for in the atmosphere with the spectral fingerprint that we talked about before is water, oxygen, ozone, nitrous oxide, because 99.9% .9 of that is produced on Earth by bacteria. And then you want to know if it has greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane. So that's what we're going to do. So yes, sorry for my, so Lee asked, are fluffy planets gaseous? I use fluffy as meaning not very dense. So yes, I use fluffy as meaning gaseous. So I'm sorry for using a very colloquial term on that. Good for catching me. Actually, fluffy just means that it's not as dense as rock when I use it right now. Um, it just means that the planet is more akin or more alike to Jupiter than it is to Earth. So it's gaseous, or most of it is gaseous. But let me move on with this. So once you have these things you can look for, let's have a look. Let's have a look at our own Earth. So this is actually the spectral fingerprint. If you split the light out, this white dot of light from red to blue, so this is where the blue is, oops, enter, this is where the blue is, this is where the red is, and here you see this is not a nice smooth curve, right? There are wiggles in this curve, and these wiggles are the chemicals again, so water, and this deep wiggle here is oxygen, this wiggle here is water again, so if you have a look at our own Earth, you see that you can see in the visible of where we see water and oxygen, and this is how it looks like. If the Earth was a tiny point very far away, this is what you would see. And then up here, where you have a tiny, tiny bump, this is where you might be able to see plants. Because it's a very small feature, but if you get bigger and bigger telescopes, you might be able to say whether or not there are green plants on that planet. If you have a look at the heat that a planet emits, remember the shoe, remember the coffee cup. So if you had your infrared goggles on, uh, then you could see this. And this is, again, a picture of our own Earth. There was a mission that went to Mars, turned around, and had a look at our own planet. And so here you see CO2, here you see water, here you see ozone, and then here you see methane. Again, this is not a smooth curve, right? It would be a smooth curve, that means there would be no atmosphere. But there's things missing. There's energy missing. And that energy tells you what chemical you have in the atmosphere. So when I talk, Alex was asking what's the spectral fingerprint exactly. I basically just split up the light, the white light and its components. And then I have a look if they're unique features. That's basically what you look for in a fingerprint too, right? And those unique features tell me whether I'm looking at an Earth-like planet or whether I'm looking at a Venus-like planet or a Mars-like planet. So by making it easier for me and not always saying that I take a spectrum from this and this and this, I just keep talking about a fingerprint. But it's a spectral fingerprint because it characterizes a planet very, very well, as you'll see on the next slide. Because if you observe a planet, and now we know how our own Earth looks like, so again, water, CO2, and ozone.
But the question is, do other things look different? Because if all other things look the same, then we can't find life that way. Because we know so far that Venus doesn't have life and Mars doesn't have life right now or no life that we can actually see. So if you have a look at the other planets in our own system, here you have Venus and here you have Mars, you see CO2, carbon dioxide, the thing that heats our planet, right? The problem that we have right now with the greenhouse gas. But you don't see water and you don't see oxygen. So ozone, oxygen, and water seem to be a very good guess, a very good bet for indicating at least that this planet can be habitable. That's really, really exciting. Uh, so Sharon just asked if we have any evidence that other organisms can live in very different conditions to what we have here on Earth. Actually, we have incredibly weird organisms here on Earth. And those organisms can live in salt mines, they can live under rocks very, very deep in, next to radioactive material. We call them extremophiles. So yes, they can, look un they can live under very, very different conditions. But what you're actually looking for is something that produces a telltale sign in the atmosphere that indicates for you as an alien astronomer, so being not on that planet and you can't sift through the dirt, but you're very far away. The only thing you have to go on is the light you collect from that planet. So you need life that actually produces something, gases in the atmosphere. And for our own planet, oxygen is what life produces. And yes, we are incredibly looking for uh, things that organisms could produce that we could pick up in an atmosphere remotely too. But so far, we haven't found many other things that are very unique to life. Because again, things like carbon dioxide and methane that's also produced by life can also be produced without life. And so the big thing here is that you have to find some signatures that actually tell you that there is life or that there's a huge chance that there's life. Not just that there could be life, but it could also be something else. Because if you can't go there for now, you want to be able to actually say, okay, I'm pretty sure there's life, or, well, there could be, or there could not be, right? So, as we have this one, let's have a look further. Well, this is a very complicated graph, so don't worry too much about it. This is, again, our own Earth. And I just wanted to bring up the point that water takes out here this absorption and here this. Ozone takes out this part of the absorption, so just that you get a feeling how much energy each of the species gets out of. And I was asked once, what about intelligent life? So I've told you that if you look, if you have oxygen, especially oxygen with methane because they react like crazy with each other. So if you have oxygen sticking around while you have methane in an atmosphere, that means something produces oxygen in huge amounts. And so that, so far, on a temperate planet like ours, we only know life to be able to do that. But if you go further and you want to actually have a look at intelligent life, what could you look for? And what comes up there is man-made gases. And so we ran a very funny exercise. We were saying, well, what kind of gases have we made? And we actually have fridges. And fridges produce something that's called freons. Freons are man-made gases that we put out in the atmosphere. It was a very, very bad idea because they actually destroy our ozone layer. It's really not good. But up here, this tiny, tiny blip here, and you don't see it very well, but here, trust me, there's one here and there's one here, tiny one, these are the things that freons would actually show. So if somebody or if another alien civilization hadn't figured out that freon actually destroys the ozone hole and had much more of it still in the atmosphere, these features would be deeper and potentially detectable. Question is, of course, then, if we still say that they are intelligent, because if you destroy the thing that shelters you from UV radiation, that's probably not a good sign for you. So for the first generation missions, we're not going to be able to do these tiny things like freons, like man-made gases. But we're going to be able to do the big signs of life. And the really cool thing about it, too, so on the right, again, this is the spectral fingerprint of our own Earth. 
And this is with a small telescope. So here you see CO2, ozone, water. But if you just could stare a little longer, then you can actually see that here you have a blip in the CO2 feature. And that tells you about our atmosphere. It tells you that somewhere in our atmosphere, it gets hotter again. It gets colder, and then it gets hotter again. So it's very cool what you can read out from something like that. So yes, there was another really good question. A couple of questions coming up here, actually. Has any life been able to be produced without oxygen? And before that, is weren't there any experiments done that actually uh, tried to figure out what life could produce? Yes, there's a lot of experiments that have been done that we were trying to get uh, to figure out what we could be looking for. And the really, really hard thing there is that so far we can't make life in the laboratory. That's going to be one of the other great breakthroughs that hopefully going to come in the next couple of years. Because as soon as you can make life, you can put other stuff in it and see if, if you don't have water or if you don't have carbon, life would actually produce something else. And uh, we are not there yet. But the other question is also, has there been any life before we had oxygen or life that doesn't produce oxygen? There's a lot of it. There's bacteria that produces methane, methanogens. There's bacteria that produces CO2. There's bacteria that produces nitrous oxide. Lots of life does not produce oxygen. But as I said before, the big problem is that for methane and carbon dioxide, you don't need life to produce it. So I can look for it, and it's going to be interesting. But there always will be the question whether or not there could be a, a logical explanation that doesn't involve life at all. OK, actually, before we go any further, I would like to bring another question in. And that is like, do you think such life will be like us? And it's just a yes, no question. Jonathan is going to bring it in right now. So I'm just curious what you guys think, because I can tell you. No, yes, no, yes. I'm just really curious what you think about that, because we are trying to figure this out. We are trying to figure out if life will be like us or if life will be very different. But again, since we can't do it in the lab, the only thing we can do is actually go out there and look for the spectral fingerprint and look if any of it indicates that there's a completely different life out there and if the biologists at the same time on the ground can make sense of what we see. So let me go a little further. I told you before that some of these planets, so we found about 400 planets, and about 50, 60 of those, up to 80 actually, I think we are between 60 and 80 right now, uh, actually transit a star. So they go in front of the star and thus block out some of the light. And for this subset, we know the radius because it goes in front of the star and the mass because it keeps tugging on the star, right? So, but only for about three of those have we come to the point because they are so Fluffy, they have a gaseous envelope, a gas atmosphere. It's not like on the Earth, 100 kilometers, but thousands of kilometers. So much, much more gas on top of this planet. That some of the light that goes through that tiny ring, the atmosphere, actually has been observed. And you see here again, these telltale absorption features that I was talking to you about before. And here, for example, you see water. And then in here, you see water and methane. So this planet is nothing like ours because it's bigger than Jupiter, it's hotter than Jupiter. But we can start to read its spectral fingerprint. What's amazing, and if we find a smaller planet, when our telescopes get bigger so that we can do this for the smaller planet, we can look for this really, really, really cool signs that could indicate life. And so this was done in 2007 for EGP's extrasolar giant planet. And this is how you and me would look like. And I have a formula down on the bottom here in case you're more interested what it depends on, but don't worry about it for now. So what you do see is that this is what we would look like. So our atmosphere, when the planet goes in front of the star, 
would also show things like carbon dioxide, water, ozone, and methane. So whether this planet goes in front of the star, so blocks out some of the light, and we can get the spectrum that way, for some of them, we'll be able to do that with the follow-up of Hubble. If we're really lucky, and they're really close, and if they're bigger, it helps too. So if some of these super-Earth are around our closest stars, we'll be able to do something like this to make a picture, not as great in resolution, you know, you see a lot of wiggles in this, in this picture, but we'll be able to create the spectral fingerprint for a planet and figure out whether or not it is like our own planet. And the follow-up telescope, the one after Hubble, is supposed to launch by 2014 right now. So think about it. You only have to wait a couple of years to answer this, if we're really lucky. If none of the closest stars has one of these planets, then we'll have to wait a little longer until we actually uh, get a mission that can block out the stellar light. So this is 2014 plus. And one of the things that we're talking about, and I googled this, is this habitable zone. So you have to be at the exact right distance from the star, not to be too cold, not to be too hot. So it's basically a Goldilocks zone. And this is, as Google puts it, or a picture in Google puts it, the interesting bit. But of course, now, after you guys probably have been to the movies, you can see that it's not only a planet that's the right size in this habitable zone, but potentially even a planet that actually has a moon around it in this habitable zone that could be a habitat. So this is the other part of the picture you didn't see before. Before I showed you everything until here to show the many Neptune super Earth, but maybe one of these moons could be something like Cameron and Vision. I need your help. They might need your help. You never know. What I love about the movie is not the story and, uh, well, even so, like, that, that is good too, but it just shows you that we have no idea how amazing, how amazing these worlds could be and how different these worlds could be. So everything is still in that ballpark. And so this is why I was curious what kinds of worlds do you think we will find? And if we find an Earth, and this goes back to a question we had before. If we find an Earth, how could we actually say if there's uh, bacteria up there or something that's evolved like you and me? So, who is there? Bacteria, dinosaurs, or maybe a very evolved species. And in case you don't know, this is actually Einstein. So, Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago. And it took about two and a half billion years until there was life that produced oxygen. Before that, there was still life, but it didn't produce oxygen. So we couldn't distinguish it from anything that was non-life. And then up here, if you have a look, just in case you want to go and find somebody like you and me, this is how long, if this whole thing is a 24-hour clock, this is how long you and me have been around up here, see? a couple of seconds before midnight. So we want to know how we can find life in the early stages and how life would look like once it starts to form and once then it becomes more complex. And it creates, again, these spectral fingerprints, very unique features that tell you how old that planet is and whether or not you have evolved life out there, assuming that it's similar to ours. So what you see here is the top of, uh, bar here is the Earth being very young, about 4 billion years ago. And then down here, it's about 2 billion years ago, half its age for now. And you see oxygen and methane. So that basically indicates to you that there's life on this planet. And this is how we look right now. 
And we have a couple of amazing telescopes out there uh, that actually are looking for planets like ours, but they're looking by trying to figure out if the stars get periodically dimmer. And I think we have a couple more polls on this. Jonathan? You bet. Uh, Lisa, we're going to bring up a couple of polls, and I'm going to ask you uh, one or two quick questions. We'll do a lightning round with a few more questions, and you were fantastic about uh, addressing questions as they came in, so thank you. Um, There's a a question about this idea of an alternate reality, uh, this uh, suggestion that, for example, when the ships came from the New World uh, to the New World, that that, uh, because large ships were unfamiliar, people didn't even notice them, was the, the, the comment that I believe Wendy made. Um, is it possible that we're too fixed, is the question, on our own reality not to uh, be open to other kinds of um, uh, s- life-sustaining systems beyond our own? I think the best uh, example of that that I know from science fiction is when they said, what about if the time scales are so different? What about if the movement of such a species, if I think in that science fiction book, it was a rock. We perceive this thing as a rock because it just moved every thousand years, right? So I think if the timescales are very different, we might not notice. But other than that, we're trying to keep our our eyes and every other senses actually open very much and try to expect the unexpected. But if you go and look, you do want to look for something that you know how to find, and everything else is Well, well put. Thank you for addressing that. We have a question up on the screen asking people if it would change our life here on Earth if we found life on another planet, and we're finding that the vast majority of uh, people in our vast audience today do think it would change us profoundly. Um, We're going to take one more question, and then I'm so glad you talked about imagination and uh, thinking differently, because that is essentially our next topic, which we'll be starting in about three minutes. Um, But uh, one last question. There were so many good ones here. Um, You talked a a little bit earlier, uh, a lot, about the spectral fingerprints, and there are some people wondering what strength uh, telescopes, uh, what greater strength telescopes will do uh, in the short term. You have a picture uh, of some of them here. What can we expect in terms of new technology and your ability to detect other life, of life on other planets? So for now, so for now the ones we have up there are going to find planets the right size. So they're going to find planets like the Earth. But we need the next generation that can block out the star or read the atmosphere to tell you whether it's a Venus or whether it's an Earth. So there are worlds without ends out there. And we're building the telescopes that can actually look for them because it will set our own planet in context. Because right now, we are the only thing that is habitable that we know of. And we want to learn how to take care of our own planet. And the one thing I want to leave you with is that this habitable zone, where it's just right for there to be water, we already found two of these big, potentially rocky super-Earths that are just on the corners of it. And this is a system with a couple of stars. And so this is what somebody made. We already have super-Earths that could be potentially habitable. Maybe next month we find one that's smack in the middle. So then we really want to go and go out there and characterize them because we don't have to wait for thousands of years like the Greek philosophers to answer the question whether or not we alone in the universe. Lisa, thank you uh, so much for joining us from Austria today after a long journey, uh, which doesn't seem so long after your discussion about our great distances from these other worlds today. So we want to thank you and thanks for joining us again on camera to share your smile with us. Thanks, everybody, for being here. You bet. We want to encourage everybody. And it should be extremely Uh, exciting. We'll be following your work, and we really appreciate it. We will be uh, uh, joining you again in about a minute and a half, two minutes. We'll take a quick break. Uh, We'll be joined by Margaret Whitecamp, who is here with us at the Smithsonian. She's a curator in the Division of Space History, and she is going to hook on to this theme of imagination, uh, and we're going to talk about how we have imagined other worlds, and I think you're going to find it a really wonderful transition from Lisa's talk. So stay tuned, and don't forget that the discussion can continue 
in the discussion area for Lisa's session underneath her program description, the same page you used to enter our discussion today. So use that. And do also know that the exhibit hall has some fantastic clips from the SAO uh, where you will see Lisa's uh, d answering a lot of questions that came up today as well. We'll see you all in just about a minute. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back with Margaret. Thanks everyone and thank you Lisa. Thanks Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye.